This week on To the Contrary. Up first, preventing child deaths. Then, a media rarity, a movie about a successful abortion. Behind the headlines, the Humane Society works to end what it calls a form of horse torture. The public does not know what goes on behind the scenes of the Tennessee walking horse. I'm Bonnie Irvay. Welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. Up first, saving children. The U.S. Agency for International Development is pulling together an unprecedented amount, almost $3 billion, to save a half million children in impoverished nations. 6.6 .6 million children under the age of five die every year. Many of those deaths are easily prevented. We think if we can get country heads of state and ministries of health, big companies and small entrepreneurs all working side by side to eliminate child death, that by 2030 we could live in a world where kids don't die of simple diseases like diarrhea, pneumonia, or malaria. To expand its reach, USAID is working with private industry and nonprofits to reduce the financial burden on taxpayers. Over the last four years, our private sector partnerships are up dramatically. In fact, across USAID overall, about 9% of our spending used to go into public-private partnerships. Today, it's 45%. One such partner is Every Mother Counts, a nonprofit headed by supermodel and advocate Christy Turlington. I became a maternal health advocate when I became a mom, and I became a mom almost 11 years ago um, when my daughter was born. And after she was born, after a very good pregnancy and a great delivery, in fact, um, I hemorrhaged. So the unexpected happened. And it was that unexpected experience that illuminated that there was a global tragedy. USAID wants Americans to know it is using the money efficiently. It recently released a review of every dollar it spends to help reduce child and maternal death. Administrator Raj Shah says the agency draws rare bipartisan support in Congress. We had a reception where we had probably 30 members of Congress, uh, Republican and Democrat, uh, extraordinarily conservative Republicans and very liberal Democrats coming together and saying if America can help lead the world to end child death, that is both the morally right thing to do, but it also helps keep us stable and secure. So, Megan Beyer, will this realignment, meaning this putting together of the three billion dollars, will this produce res results? Well, Bonnie, I am sold. It saves children, it's bipartisan, it's metrics based, it's outcome oriented, it's transparent. I mean, what's not to like? <laughs> You know, Bonnie, I'm always in favor of reviewing government programs and finding out how we're using the money and putting it to the best use possible. I'm a fan of the program. I think uh, the new alignment of resources, private and partners, uh, I'm sorry, private and public together is a step in the right direction. I'm optimistic this will work. Um, I just wish that government accountability weren't such a rarity. <laughs> <laughs> so would you tell other programs to follow this program? Absolutely. I would love for this to succeed so that they can say, you know what, the rest of you should implement that. So. Yep. Uh, I have to throw this out there. The other side, of course, is we have people suffering in this country. Um, we're still not out of the Great Recession by any means. Unemployment is still high. Um, should, I mean, if you were in an inner city with, you know, an, a, an unwed mother with two hungry children, how would you feel about this? I actually work primarily on domestic issues that are incredibly urgent, incredibly pressing, and yet still understand the importance in addressing global poverty. It's not just a moral issue, it's not just about values, it's also very much about national security. We understand and research shows that the insecurity and instability abroad actually impacts the amount of national security threats we face here at home. Um, so there's there's definitely a moral part here, but it's also self-interested. Mm -hmm. um, and if honestly, if we're going to address domestic issues, I'd love to see us redirect some of our money away from our drone diplomacy that currently exists and our foreign nation building adventures overseas and then honestly focus domestically. Well and let me throw something out there, let me respond to my own question. I was in Morocco many years ago reporting on how USAID money was being spent there and talked to one of the, the country rep for 
Morocco, and he was telling me that the U.S. a U.S. cellular company. This was in the early days of cell towers, especially overseas. Uh, had just lost a huge contract to France because France gave a lot more aid money to Morocco than the U.S. did. So well, you, coming from a you know corporate perspective, well, I, it, this is the oldest continent. It is also an emerging economy, and we need to look at Africa that way. There is no, it's no accident that China is in Africa all over the place, building infrastructure, roads, uh, water. You know, they are definitely looking forward to bringing Ch uh, Africa out of the third world into the first world when they will become a market. But I still like to go back to this idea that it's moral authority. The, the piece of our public image that the world still understands and connects with is that the Americans come in and help people. And this is great for that branding and helps us worldwide in that way, and it helps us in the global economy that way. It is true that we should be providing humanitarian aid to whichever countries we can, whenever we can. But I do think to the to your point, you know, it does make sense to go into countries and help them get on track economically because then we're building business partners uh, for the future. At that point, the reason I raised it, by the way, is you never see it made. Mm -hmm. I even asked uh, Administrator Shah uh, about that, and it's not a point that he, I asked him the question: What are the benefits that Americans don't see. Well, uh, and and part of asked it, him to point this out, but part of it is because it does sound semi-insensitive. Like we should go here because I think that we could get a lot of money out of them in the future. You know, that doesn't sound very polite. Well, you so. don't have to put it that way, but you can just raise awareness among Americans that there are. Be benefits you wouldn't think of normally in these situations. I think what I'm really interested in, well, I open up by saying I think this is a fantastic program. I'm actually more interested in seeing how it's actually implemented on the ground. Um, while it certainly helps the American brand, uh, brand of helping, I'm not a fan of the kind of American savior brand of kind of parachuting into another um, thriving country, and uh, thriving in, in, in different kind of metrics, but um, and then coming and saying we know what's best, here we are. So I think it's mm -hmm. this as a fantastic program, the influx of resources will help, but I also think it has to to be done properly and respectfully. Sure, like look at the dividends of the Marshall Plan in Europe. You know, for many years, the fact that we helped to build their economy was, came back to us many times over. Mm. Um, I really, I'm, I'm excited about the public-private partnership aspect of it, where we're not having government bureaucrats reinvent the wheel. These are people who know supply chain logistics, who know how to get things to market, and who understand the local environment on the ground. It's not just some well-meaning 26-year-old who's working with, um, you know, a foreign aid organization. That these are really people who get what's going on. And so. I think these companies deserve credit. Coca-Cola, Accenture, Johnson and Johnson. I think it was Coca-Cola that said, "Why not use our supply chain if you're having trouble to get?" Uh, medications where they need to go. Everybody gets a Coke everywhere. You know, <laughs> we can figure out how to get to villages the villages in the world. And, and right. let's be honest, there is, and I've, I've worked with these companies, in particular Coca Cola, on their pro social stuff, and there's a self interest there as well. Absolutely. But so. it saves lives. All right. <laughs> Let us know what you think. Please follow me on Twitter at Bonnie or Bay or at To the Contrary. From childbirth to abortion. A new movie, Obvious Child, is the first in 30 years in which the female lead becomes unexpectedly pregnant, has an abortion, and is fine with her decision, almost without exception. Movie and TV portrayals of unplanned pregnancies end with the woman either happily having the baby, as in knocked up, or miscarrying, or having an abortion and dying, as in Revolutionary Road. The last time a major motion picture portrayed a successful abortion was in 1982 in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And the female director of that film told Slate magazine she didn't think she could get away with that today. So um, 1982 and we all these movies, I saw one that came out a few months ago, I can't remember the name of it, but it was about a young woman, single mom, daughter of a single mom, having all kinds of psychological and financial problems, and she went to her church and got talked into keeping the baby. And I remember thinking, this just seems so out of date. What's going on? Well, you're forgetting Juno. That came out recently, to speak to your first point. That came out, it was a very popular movie, and she doesn't end up having the abortion and gets, you know, talked out of it. But anyway, to, to speak to the original point that you were making, I, I think the thing is that every side of this debate wants to say, well, our side is winning, the, the opponents do, and the proponents do. But when you really look at the polls, you know, uh, Americans are still very divided on the issue of abortion. Bill Clinton's famous saying 20 years ago now that abortion should be safe, legal, 
legal and rare sticks for most Americans. And I think that in the, the case of this movie, you know, it was uh, NBC almost, NBC originally didn't want to show the, the previews for this movie. And that's why, is because so many Americans are still divided on this issue. And I mean, you know, when that happened, I, I, what I love about the new generation, all the social media stuff, is that you get an immediate reaction to a decision you've made corporately on a topic that people feel strongly about. And you saw that again within a space of five days. NBC was backtracking and now running commercials on this uh, movie that do reference abortion. And I think we've seen that while perhaps film has not been uh, representing this choice, uh, this pregnancy choice much. What you see in social media is that they're fully engaged in all kinds of reproductive health issues. And when a company or some kind of policy or an issue comes up, it just lights up the social media. And I, th I predict that that is going to change uh, what companies do. I think it might change what Hollywood does. Uh, there was a study done by the journal uh, Contraception and it showed that negative myths and culturally uh, kind of negative ideas about abortion that are not factually true are perpetuated in film. And, and I think that may change because of the responsiveness in social but, you media. You know, Hollywood is always being accused of being so liberal. I'm not sure it's liberal as much as it is corporate, but if that's, you know, it's about money, let's face it. Yeah, um, I so, find But why is Hollywood so behind the times in terms of, you know, you can't, you can show war, you can show people's heads being blown off, you can't talk about a woman having a six, uh, an abortion she wants and is happy about having. Yeah, this is something that has bothered me for years, so um, I'm actually, I'm interested, and I was interested to read the statistics about how the percentage of women in film and TV that um, are portrayed as dying as a result of this, as opposed to it's the actual It's 15%. The real in the 300 uh, movies that this study looked at, it was 15%. Whereas the real statistic died. Whether was less than 1%. Right. And no, less than 0.01%. Um, but then looking at studies by the Guttmacher Institute and other organizations, where who are the women who are actually making these decisions? These are not single women in the inner cities. These are often married women. These are mm -hmm. often older women. Um, and so I would, I, I am optimistic that Hollywood will catch up to reality. But this is not a question of pro-choice or pro-life. This is a question about Hollywood, film, art, culture, really reflecting the totality of women's lives. And that's what this is about. And on that regard, Hollywood is, is far from liberal. When you look at the percentage of women directors and producers and writers, um, when you look at the kind of flat, one-dimensional characters that women, are, that women often portray, and Hollywood is far from liberal. Gina Davis Institute for Gender and the Media has done a great job of outing that. And in fact, she's now doing a global global study looking at film from other cultures. She's done the definitive work on what's happened in the U.S. and how women are barely recognized, even in a group shot. If you ever see a wide shot with a crowd, the average number of women in a crowd shot in a U.S. movie is 17 percent. So you wonder why we only have 70 percent women on boards? They think that's half. How is it, how is it that uh, even in 1956, the predecessor to the MPAA, the Motion Picture Association, ratings um, system even mentioned that you're supposed to, movies were not supposed to really mention abortion at all and if they uh, did show them, they should show them as tragedies. Well, at that time, it did reflect reality because mm -hmm. abortion was illegal. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, one would at, hope At the federal level. Exactly. I'm right. not sure, yeah, pro and probably at most state levels. Yeah. But, um, but uh, again, unsafe. why, yeah. that's 58 years ago, you would think they would have, that, that the influence of that would have left, but it hasn't. It hasn't. Again, I think it, ha it really has a lot to do with the role of women behind the scenes, the role of women uh, um, and the, on the corporate side of Hollywood. But I also think there's kind of, we're in this moment now, both domestically and globally, where we're seeing um, a, a focus on women, women's lives, women's rights, women's health. And I do, th I feel optimistic that Hollywood will catch up. But I do too. think it does go back to money to a certain extent, though. This is something that's untried. Like you mentioned, this is the first movie that's portrayed it this way in a while. Uh, it's a risk. Monetarily, it is a risk to create a movie like this that's kind of subversive. It's a risk for NBC to air previews like that. But um, should uh, having an abortion be seen as subversive? 
I, I'm not arguing that it necessarily should be seen that way, but I do definitely think, again, going back to polls, that half of America thinks that uh, abortion should either be legal or illegal or it should yeah, be one in three. Limited. One in three one American in women has an abortion during her lifetime. I mean, yeah. it's not exactly... Sure, but let me just take a second to tell you uh, an interesting story, sorry, I think you might be interested in. Two years ago, I was at NetRoots, which is the premier progressive conference, and one of the candidates for Congress who was speaking at the conference wanted to glorify abortion and asked everyone who'd had an abortion to stand up and say, I'm proud to say that I've had an abortion, I'm not ashamed. There were nearly 250 to 500 women in that room. By your statistics, especially at a progressive conference, you think that more than a handful of people would have had an abortion. But yet I saw only a handful of people stand up. So that tells me that even within progressive culture, it's still looked at as something to be ashamed but, of. But the question is really about the relationship between art, culture, and politics and public opinion, right? So it's a chicken or egg conversation. Yes. We're understanding actually that perhaps the reason there is a stigma is because the media has been so reluctant to show the totality of women's lives, not necessarily the other way around. All right, behind the headlines, when tradition means torture. For more than half a century, the Tennessee walking horse has made money for its owners, won ribbons for riders, and dazzled audiences with a unique gait. But oftentimes that success comes at the expense of the beloved breed. The public does not know what goes on behind the scenes of the Tennessee walking horse. They need to know the abuse that goes on, the cruelty that goes on, to get these walking horses do what they do. Priscilla Presley, widow of Elvis Presley, is one of a number of advocates who want Congress to take action. So does Illinois Democrat Jan Schakowsky, who says it's torture. In order to get Tennessee walking horses to do that lift in an unnatural way, they actually um, burn and uh, hurt, injure, the horses so that they, it, it hurts for them to put their feet down and they lift them up. The controversial movement is called the Big Lick. The inhumane practice used by some trainers is called soaring. Various cruel methods soar horses, which include painting on or injecting caustic chemicals in the horse's legs, such as diesel fuel or kerosene, then wrapping the legs in plastic so the chemicals burn the flesh. They put chains on the ankles of the horse so that it hits the flesh or the beast or the injured area. There's also another technique called pressure shoeing, and that's where they trim the horse's hooves almost to the quick. And then they, um, after they do that, they tightly nail in the shoe, and they also put things inside the hoofs. Such as golf balls, screws, and other foreign objects. Soaring has been outlawed since the Horse Protection Act of 1970, but enforcement by the USDA has been limited, that due to a lack of funding. The USDA can only afford to attend fewer than 10% of the more than 300 shows where Tennessee walkers are exhibited. The problem was the inspections were all done by an association that is essentially paid for by the people who show these Tennessee walking horses. There are people who profit from this, um, doing the shows, selling the horses, sometimes selling them for lots and lots of money, um, and then just somehow the prestige. The Presleys had Tennessee walking horses at Graceland after falling in love with the breed. They even named one after their home. A trophy in honor of her family's champion horse, Graceland, was formerly awarded every year at the most renowned show in the industry, The Celebration. The event in Shelbyville, Tennessee, attracts nearly a quarter of a million fans from more than 40 states. One of the reasons why I got involved was that this trophy was still being passed around. So I asked um, Mike Inman, who's the CEO of this uh, celebration, uh, to please uh, give it back, that we no longer support it. Presley partners with the Humane Society to lobby Congress for support of the PAST Act, with reforms aimed at eliminating corrupt self-policing and applying stricter penalties for violators. But some members of Congress worry the bill threatens tradition. At a recent demonstration on Capitol Hill, Tennessee walkers who were not tortured or soared performed their famous gait. 
They, their writers, and other supporters were not just there to support the PAST Act, but also to out an alternative bill that pretends to protect the horses. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell co-sponsors one such pretend bill, and Representative Marsha Blackburn has introduced her own. They're saying, you know, it will stop it. It will not. I know that Marsha Blackburn is saying we can use technology to police or to do the inspections. I mean, that's another way of getting away with what they're doing now. So it's, it is a sham. A bad bill is, uh, is worse than no bill because I think it could give the appearance that we're actually doing something when in fact that, that we aren't. The PAST Act has bipartisan support from 300 members of Congress, but it's stalled in the Energy and Commerce Committee, vice chaired by Blackburn. Her bill has 12 co-sponsors. I know that we would have the votes if we could really get it called to move it out of committee and then move it on to the, uh, the, the floor. So it's just a matter of increasing the, the pressure. I know that, you know, there's lots of other, uh, other priorities, but why would we continue to allow this inhumane practice to continue? I would love the public to know what's going on behind the scenes. If they knew and they could call their legislators, their senators, and say, please vote in the PAST Act to get this thing on the floor. I'm in shock that this hasn't gotten to the floor and done. By the way, we did call uh, Representative Blackburn for a response and got no response from her office. Holly, welcome to the panel. Full disclosure, I own a horse farm outside Washington, D.C. I'm a hunter-jumper rider. Uh, there's cruelty in, in the division that I uh, go in. Surely use of drugs has been pointed out and such, but this, it, it, it's nothing compared to what they do to the walker horses. Um, and I'm such a fan, I must say, I'm outing myself uh, of, what, of the work you're doing. In this day and age, how could people want to do this? You know, the this animals. Is, I think you hit on it. There, anywhere where people and animals are together, there's going to be there are going to be some people who are going to in, employ cruel techniques to get ahead. But the difference between that and this industry is that the cruelty is right at the core of the industry. It's with the industry leaders. It's with the organizations that fund and promote the the practices. And so the only way to get to this cruelty and to abolish it is to get rid of the of the industry itself and to support the Tennessee Walker. In, in the kinds of shows and with the kinds of people who are going to take care of them and have compassion for them. How long have you been working on this bill and when? what's its chance of passage? Well, we're, we're very hopeful it's going to pass. The, the, the only issue now is, is timing. There are very few legislative days left, but we have got probably not unprecedented, but a significant uh, number of amount of support on the Hill from both Republicans and Democrats. We've got 350 members of Congress and, and senators who are supporting this bill, 120 of them Republicans. So there is significant and broad support for this legislation. And why is it that, t tell me, what's motivating Marsha Blackburn, um, Mitch McConnell, Rand Paul is a co-sponsor of the what we call pretend bill because it has a name that makes it sound like it's going to save the horses and yet it allows these horrible practices that people saw in the videotape to keep going on. Um, wh why are they doing this? Well, I think it's, um, for those of us who have been in Washington a long time, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to come up with a case or an issue where uh, there isn't some cynicism surrounding it. And I, and I hate to say that, but in the case of Lamar and Alexander, who is a strong proponent of, we call it the, Tro the Trojan Horse Bill, um, Steve Smith, who is ca his campaign uh, director, is the president of TWEBA, the horse industry association that's promoting the status quo. And with the issue of uh, the a case of Marsha Blackburn, she um, has been um, supported by the industry. They held a $100 a person uh, campaign um, um, uh, 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 fundraiser. Fundraiser, thank you. Fundraiser for her. And then two months later or three months later, she came out with her, with her version of the bill. So I think it's just what people don't like about Washington. See, I think that's very unfair to put words or to assign a motivation to her. And that, I mean, I understand that's how Washington works. Isn't but money, is, but uh, in but fairness, not just to her, but to yeah. Isn't money let's always at, behind? Yeah, so these let's things? look at the other side of this equation. Let's I printed out what the actual bill does, okay? One of the things is that it creates a new licensing process for inspectors requiring USDA to train, license, and appoint independent inspectors. Licensed or accredited veterinarians were given preference for these positions. So who stands to benefit from that? The Veterinarians Association. So I, then I started to run the numbers. How many oh, wait, vets, the, what's how your many vets are what's there? your response? I mean, to my that? response is I that that the industry has been given a chance for four 
40 years, 40 years to run this himself, to run it without license run inspections, to run their things. inspections to make sure that these abhorrent practices are not taking place. I personally met with the industry six years ago. I sat down with leaders in this industry and said, let's negotiate. Let's figure out a path forward where there is not this abuse. I was manipulated and I was lied to. The United States Department of Agriculture, which is charged with, with bringing these uh, uh, veterinarians on board now, or which, which hopefully will be ch which charged that, has been trying to work with this industry for 40 years to get them to police themselves. And we've been on So who that else would you have? I mean, a vet. Can, How many you know, vets are there in the state of Tennessee? Right? I don't know. So it, there are 242,000 horses in this state. There are the American right, Veterinary well, what's your Medicine So you're saying that this is, oh, we're out of time, I'm sorry, but you're no. saying that this is, this profits vets, okay. That's it for this edition. <laughs> Please follow me on Twitter and visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. Whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week.